Good evening, and thank you for joining us on a rainy Sunday evening for this third edition of Sound Health, Music in the Mind, which we are calling Renew and Remix. Seems perfect for where we are in our world today. This project is um, a pet project for those of us who care deeply about music and well-being at the Kennedy Center. When Renee Fleming came to me when she first became our artistic advisor at large, she said, I think there's something here. Let's explore it. And here we have had quite a wonderful journey. You have uh, a wonderful program ahead of you with a cavalcade of luminaries and musicians who come together because they care about this topic and want to help spread the word. So thank you for being here to be a part of that. This partnership of the Kennedy Center and the National Institutes of Health and supported by the National Endowment for the Arts really came together and created, just before the pandemic, the Sound Health Network, which you'll hear more about this evening. We're thrilled that this idea that started as a, as a, a casual conversation between friends has turned into a national network. So thank you for being here this evening. I'm not gonna go into any more detail, but to introduce what I call the godparents of Sound Health, Renee Fleming and Dr. Francis Collins. I really like that, godparents. That's yeah, I hadn't good. heard that before. Okay, <laughs> that works. We haven't seen you in this hall for four years. This is very exciting. Yeah. Welcome. We've been to, very busy, too. Uh, yeah, I think all of us have had quite the experience for the last two and a half years. Uh, for me, ha having served as a great privilege as the director of the National Institutes of Health through much of that, I got to say the scientific community did an amazing job of responding to this worst pandemic. Yeah, let's hear it for them. Chapeau, absolutely. We are grateful. We are indeed, and it's so good to be able to be back here again, because I think one of the things that I missed the most, Renee, was the chance to be together and make music together. I did a lot of solo music in my living room. It was okay, but this is better. And to be no, here at the Kennedy Center with all of these amazing people you're about to hear from, this is something I've looked forward to for about three years. <laughs> well, and I know every time I'm in the house as you are in, at a performance, I am so grateful for this shared experience, this is experiencing something together and not alone and not isolated is really important. In fact, our brains align. The waves in our brains actually align when we're listening to something together. Indeed, and you've already touched upon one of the aspects of sound health that makes it so exciting is bringing together cutting edge neuroscience with amazing kinds of performance and with music therapists who've been using music as a means to help people who are struggling with a long list of conditions to get better. And now bringing all those disciplines together, we are seeing the sparks fly in a most remarkable way. And that's what sound health is all about. And I think also the pandemic really it made it hit home how much we need each other, this idea of social cohesion, the way that people perform for each other, you know, on roofs and outside of windows. And in fact, the whole field has been galvanized by that. It's exploding. So you'll hear some of these extraordinary stories tonight. You'll hear amazing performances from, from uh, extraordinary performers who are actually very interested in this intersection yes. of health and science. And somebody mentioned that somehow you and I are to be blamed for all of this. Do you want to, want to explain how that all started? Yes, absolutely. let's tell this story. The it's origin a, story. It's legend. It's legend now. <laughs> it was a lovely summer evening <laughs> in early July 2015. There was a dinner party. And at that dinner party were three Supreme Court justices. They didn't all necessarily think the same about what had just happened that week, which was the Supreme Court deciding that gay marriage was legal. How about that? That's okay. right. Uh, but we did have Justice Scalia and Justice Ginsburg and Justice Kennedy, 
And the evening was just a little bit tense. But they came. They, it was going to be a great dinner, and they came. And then what happened? Well, then we did what we're about to do right now. We sang a song or two. <laughs> and somehow everything got more comfortable, more friendly, more informal. Scalia started puffing on his cigar and drinking even more of the brandy that was in his glass. And, and everybody sort of started singing along. Yeah, it was great. Did we sing this song? Uh, I don't think so. We could have. It would have fit. Yes, it would have, absolutely. <laughs> well, what is this song? We better get out of the way. There's some great people sort of coming along after us. And this is a song that was written 150 years ago um, during a very tough time, just after the Civil War in this country. But it's a song that says what I think we can all feel now after what we've been through with COVID. There's a line here which says, through all the tumult and the strife, I hear the music ringing. It sounds an echo in my soul. We're going to have a lot of echoes in souls this evening. This is How Can I Keep From Singing. that hails a new creation. Through all the tumult and the strife, I hear its music ringing. It sounds an echo in my soul. How, How can, can I, I keep, keep from, from singing? Though the tempest loudly roars, I hear the truth, it shields me. What though the darkness round me close, songs in the night will heal me. No storm can shake my inmost calm, while to that rock I'm tremble in their fear and hear their death knell ringing when friends rejoice both far and near how can I keep from singing in prison cell and dungeon vile our thoughts are to them winging when friends by shame How can I keep from singing? I lift my eyes, the clouds grow dim. I see the blue above it, and day by day, this pathway smooths since first I came to love it. No storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging since love rules over heaven and earth. How can I keep from seeing A joy it is for a scientist to stand on the stage of the Kennedy Center and do a duet with Renee Fleming, the most exquisite voice on the planet. 
And Renee, thank you for everything you have done to encourage so many others to come alongside with this remarkable project, this program, this multidisciplinary effort called Sound Health. Well, it's now my privilege to tell you about the next musical event you're going to hear. And this is one that's close to my heart because this is about a young man, just 14 years old, who has been through more than almost any 14-year-old I could think of. He was born with sickle cell anemia, a disease which causes untold suffering in terms of attacks of bone pain that come out of nowhere. But on top of that, he, like some children with sickle cell disease, suffered not one, not two, but three major strokes. The most devastating one at age six, which left him unable to speak or walk. But he had a determination to do something much different with his life because starting at age two, this young man had fallen in love with the violin and had learned to play as a prodigy at age three, at age four, and then at age six with his stroke, it seemed like it was all taken away. But that was not going to be the way in which this young man approached this situation. Not only having to learn how to speak and learn how to walk, he had to learn how to play exquisitely on the violin. I met him a year ago because he came to NIH as a patient to undergo a bone marrow transplant from his sister. I'm happy to tell you that transplant was incredibly successful, and he is now cured of his sickle cell disease. And he continues to build his remarkable musical skills as a violinist. And you are now about to hear him. Please welcome to the stage, Caesar Sint.
Caesar Sand, everybody, accompanied by Robert Macy, who is a Robert, by the way, is a post baccalaureate student researcher at the National Cancer Institute. So we're really proud of him. Too. Thank you, Robert. Caesar, that was just amazing, and I think people probably want to hear a little bit from you about the amazing journey you have been on ever since uh, you started falling in love with the violin at age two and then had a lot of things come along along the way. What was, what was that like? You had this really bad stroke at age six where you couldn't speak, you couldn't walk. Was music sort of on your mind? Because you'd already started to play quite brilliantly. Something that you were wanting to get back to or are you just like, oh, I'll never be able to do that? What was that like for season? Yes, I really wanted to get back for uh, playing my violin. And when my father, uh, uh, when I was uh, sick, my father put it, uh, music for me. And then I, I would open my eyes and I, I, I knew it. So even before you were back with anything else, you were back with music? to try to pick the violin up again? Yes, sir. How many hours every day do you have to practice to bring all of that skill to a place like this? Two to three hours. And what's your favorite kind of music? You just played something beautiful. Do you have a favorite composer? I have uh, Bach. But he's my favorite. Right. <laughs> and uh, Beethoven, Mozart, that's my two favorites. You came to the right place. <laughs> <laughs> so, Caesar, you've got all this talent, you've got this sickle cell thing, which now, thanks to the bone marrow, maybe you don't have to deal with that anymore. What's, what's out there in front of you? What do you want to be doing as you? go through your musical experiences here. I want to be a virtuoso violinist and a composer. I think you're well on your way. So Caesar, is there one more thing you'd like to say to this group? The Lord is God and God is good, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Please, everybody, one more hand for Caesar Singh. Wake up to power, can look for love, and when I broke, I'm trying to 
Single the diamond, I'm the same on both sides. Sides, 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 You're a stone cold killer, you say, but you're looking like a part time criminal. Wave your rape, man, you lay it on thick. It's a dive bar, shape the game. You're, you're drinking, drinking your sip. sip, easy to please, but hard to impress. I'm in a mood, new shoes, and a bulletproof dress. Sugar on the rim, and a shot of a scale. It's murder in the morning, but it's good for morale. Can you order more? Looks like you're breaking with both hands. Favorite lover, the skeleton won't stand. The plan, man, I'm trying to call an audible problem for lost cause, but I gotta do for long shots. Yes, yes. What do you think they got the wrong odds? I've done some living in the glass house. I know who the mother was on. We're hungry. There's a bell to tell us we're tired. There's a bell that tells us to rise and fight. A bell to rise and die. It's just a bell. Sometimes I ring myself to see if I might, see if I might, see if I might, see if I might. I ring myself to see if I might, see if I might, see if I might, see if I might. I need to tell you that I'm all that's 
curve is above the cone. We pitch and roll, we we'll flesh and bone, don't control us. It's all for low, we leave the turn to the control. All lines are curved and they grow. We pitch and roll, we'll splash and bones on control and it's it's eyes alone. To see if I might see if I might see if I might see if I might I ring my shell. To see if I might see if I might see if I might see if I might shine. center stage and see if I can't drag the light with me. <laughs> well, for somebody who has spent, yes, yes, thank you, Billy. For someone who has spent most of her career on the club circuit, I am particularly excited to make this next <laughs> introduction because I don't anticipate that I will have the opportunity to make it equal. Will you please help me join the US Surgeon General Vivek Morthy to stage? Thanks for joining us. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. It's always a pleasure to come back to the Kennedy Center. Y yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've read a lot of your work and had the opportunity to listen to some of the speeches and the podcasting that you're doing now as well. You've spoken and written a lot about loneliness in the context of public health as a concern, really, to our bodies in addition to our minds and our social connections. Why would loneliness be a topic that would interest a physician in the way it has you? Well, thanks for asking this, and thank you also for your inc incredible music. Uh, I just want to say, listening backstage to you, I was reminded of the power of music to not only heal our hearts, but to also help mend our spirits and our bodies. And so thank you for sharing uh, what you did with us today. <laughs> and it strikes me, as we think about loneliness, that one of the great antidotes to loneliness is community, and that is what we have the pleasure of experiencing here today as we gather to appreciate art and music and beauty and to understand its role in healing. But for me as a young child, I struggled a lot with loneliness myself. Uh, when I was uh, a kid getting dropped off at school in the morning by my mother, I used to feel this pit in my stomach growing. And I wasn't scared about teachers or about schoolwork, I was scared about feeling alone. Uh, and I felt that way for years. And when I became a doctor, I realized that many of the patients I was caring for were also struggling with loneliness, but I didn't know what to do about it because it wasn't something I had learned about in medical school. Uh, fast forward to when I became Surgeon General, and I started traveling around the country, talking to people in communities across America, asking them, what can I do to be helpful? And what I kept hearing again and again were stories of loneliness, of people who said, I feel I have all these burdens in my life that I have to carry by myself where I feel if I disappear tomorrow, nobody would know, or I feel invisible. And I know many of us have felt that way. And over the years, what I've come to realize is two things uh, about loneliness. One is that it's ex extraordinarily common. You know, according to some studies, more than 50% of people are struggling with loneliness. And the ones who are struggling most, it turns out, are our children and young adults. But the other thing I learned, Dessa, was that loneliness is also consequential. It impacts our health. So people who struggle with loneliness have an increased risk of anxiety and depression, but also at an increased risk of heart disease, premature uh, you know, death, dementia, sleep disturbances. And it turns out the mortality impact of loneliness is about the same as the mortality impact of smoking 15 cigarettes a day, even greater than the mortality impact of obesity. And think how much we invest in addressing smoking and obesity we have to think about loneliness also as a public health concern. You know, there was something that you... <laughs> I don't know you very well. Can I dust your shoulders off if I'm super careful not to ruin the coat? Yes, yes, take your flowers. My question... <laughs> Somebody take up. We've what known each other for two whole minutes. That's a long time. 
one of the things that I thought was so interesting about the way that you conceptualized loneliness, so that you framed it in the larger conversation, public health and otherwise, was almost like as an indicator. So like we, when we are hungry, we understand not that this is just a discomfort with which we have to survive. Hunger is an indicator to do something about it, go eat, right? Thirst is an indicator, do something about it. And will you share with the audience how you conceptualize loneliness as an indicator in that same way? Absolutely, I think it would be obvious to anyone here that food and water are essential to our survival. But it turns out that social connection is also essential to our survival. And when we're missing it, our body sends us a signal, and that signal is loneliness, similar to hunger or thirst. But the reason this is so important is sometimes when we're lonely, we feel like we're ashamed in some way. We feel like you know we did something wrong, or we're not social enough, or we lack social skills. But almost everybody experiences loneliness at some level. Uh, we don't talk about it often, so we don't know it. Uh, but it's real and it's there. And if you want to understand why it's so essential to us, just imagine for a moment that you're transported back thousands of years in history to our hunter and gatherer days. And think about the people who decided that they were going to go it alone and that they didn't need anyone else, that they were self-reliant and independent. Well, what happened to those people is they got eaten by predators <laughs> or they starved from an in, you know, insufficient food supply. The people who survived were those who recognized that our relationships mattered that when we built trusting relationships with one another, we could share food, we could protect one another, we could help with each other with childcare. It was a realization that we are truly better when we are together and when we are connected to one another. And so even though our circumstances are dramatically different today, Dessa, our nervous system is actually very similar to how it was thousands of years ago. So when we are separated from people, when we feel alone, it actually puts our body into a stress state. And in the short term, that could be good, right? It tells us something is wrong, let's fix it. But if it persists, then that chronic stress state can lead to more inflammation in our body, can influence disease processes, can also make us unhappy. And you know, you know, when you do kind of move the slider to our modern era, and we look at the kind of cultural structures that we're building, and I don't mean just like you know institutions, but I mean even just like the value systems that you find running through pop music, you know, or running through through our novels, running through the conversations that we have with the podcasts that we listen to. You've talked about this sort of competing architecture. Like our cultural values are misaligned with meaningful social connections because we're kind of running after different false idols. We're running after different points. Can you, can you describe your comments on that a little? Exactly. Yeah, and there's a word that you use there that is really essential that I want to highlight, underscore, circle, and star. And that's the word values. <clears throat> that's right. <laughs> Because we can think about, <clears throat> look, the truth is, when we look at the world today, when we look at society around us, I know many of us are worried. As a father of two small kids, uh, who I just kissed and said goodbye to before I came over to the Kennedy Center, uh, I'm worried about their future as well. And I know sometimes we look at the vitriol, the strife, the conflict around us, the loneliness, uh, the preoccupation with self and me, and we ask ourselves, is, is the future really brighter than the past? And that's why I think this is such an important moment for all of us as society, because we have a moment to rebuild a foundation of society, and that foundation is our relationships with one another. When I think about the future that I want for my children, it's a future that's informed not necessarily by policy and by programs, but by values. That's a foundation on which all of these are built. I want a, a world for my kids and all of our kids that's fueled by kindness, by compassion, by mutual concern for one another. And these are all branches on the tree of love because love is ultimately the foundation that we need to rebuild. It's the power that we have to see clearly once again. And I'll tell you that as a, as a doctor who's written prescriptions for many medications over the years, I have been humbled and inspired as I've come to see that there is no force more powerful for healing uh, than love. And that we all have the power to cultivate that in our own lives. So as we think about the challenges of the world ahead of us, as you think, I know it can seem daunting to try to transform the world from what it is now to what we need it to be for our children. But let us remember that societal change, rebuilding the social fabric of America, thread by thread, relationship by relationship, community by community, that starts with us with the steps that we take in our life, by the decisions we make about how we treat one another, about how we prioritize relationships in our life, about whether we choose to listen before we judge, 
about whether we choose to use our voices in the public square to advocate not only for ourselves but for other people. And if we do that, then we can start down this road of rebuilding the foundation for society and fueling it with love, with kindness and compassion, which is the most powerful source of healing that we desperately need right now. Dr. Vivek Murthy, you stuck the landing. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Indre Viscontis. I'm a musician and a neuroscientist and the director of communications for the Sound Health Network. We're, <laughs> We're excited too. We're a new initiative of the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with the University of California, San Francisco, and in collaboration with the National Institutes of Health, the John F. Kennedy Center, and Renee Fleming. If you want to hear more about what we do and connect with us, you can find our information in the digital program. By now, I hope you are all on board with the notion that music can have a powerful positive impact on our mental health and well-being. And I just want to take a couple of minutes to tell you a little bit of science about how that works. We often think about our brains as if they exist in a vat. Billions of cells with trillions of connections bathed in a sea of neurochemicals. And when it comes to our mental health, we think, if we could just rebalance those chemicals and rewire those connections and change our thinking patterns so that they activate the right networks we can alleviate pain and suffering, make ourselves well again. As if the individual brain is all that matters. Fix the brain, fix the problem. But it's not so easy. Even if we could tweak those chemicals and connections and activations, the brain does not exist in a vat. It is shaped by our environment, our past experiences, but especially by other people. If we want to fix the brain, we have to fix society. And the pandemic showed us just how powerful social interactions are. It shouldn't have come as a surprise, because if we look at our evolutionary history, our ancestors' skull sizes exploded around the time we started living in larger social groups. And neuroscientists, some of them anyway, very compellingly, we don't agree about everything, argue that nature selected for brains that were better adapted to navigating social situations. That collaboration, cooperation, and connection give us an evolutionary advantage. And music is a powerful connector of human beings. Around one and a half million years ago, our early humans discovered fire. And they realized that if they could cook their food, they could fuel those bigger brains much more efficiently and have a lot more time on their hands. Now, we all know what happens when we gather around a fire. We share stories. We roast marshmallows. Someone pulls out a guitar, a harmonica, or starts a song. Now, early humans did not have language for another million years. They also did not have marshmallows. <laughs> I'm not sure about the harmonica but I'm pretty sure that they were making music using their primitive voices and bodies. They were using their bodies to entertain, their primitive voices to call to each other, and maybe even drop a beat. The oldest known musical instrument outside of the body, a flute made from bone, is over 40,000 years old. That's older than the oldest known sculpture. That was carved at a time when we were still sharing the earth with Neanderthals. And surely our ancestors were making music with their voices and bodies long before then. When we were locked down in the pandemic, we couldn't help but make music. We went out to our balconies to sing, and we logged on to the internet to make music from individual boxes. Music is part of every culture and civilization that we know and permeates almost every human gathering. Now, there are multiple pathways by which music can connect us. When we listen to or make music together, our heart rates, our breathing rates, even our brain waves synchronize. 
Levels of the hormone oxytocin, sometimes called the love hormone or the attachment hormone because of the role it plays in social bonding, rise. One of my favorite studies showed that if you spray a little oxytocin up someone's nose, they can keep a beat more accurately. That's a little take-home pro tip for those of you who need a little help on the dance floor. <laughs> but we've all experienced the magic of groove. When musicians are so in sync with one another that they can have a meaningful musical conversation without ever exchanging a single word. And now we know a little bit about what's happening in their brains when they get into the zone. They turn down the volume on brain networks that are involved in self-monitoring, judging, strategizing, and instead let the emotional, intuitive, and self-expression networks sing. Here's newly minted NEA jazz master Regina Carter and Xavier Davis to show us how it's done.
Thank you so much. It was such a thrill to watch the two of you collaborate like that. Well, you know, the first song, was anybody sitting still in the audience? There, it's just, it just gets in your bones. You have to move. Well, let's move a little bit down here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask both of you what it's like to meet someone maybe for the first time or maybe you met them before and then bear your soul in such a way that you can find this deep connection. Well, I have to say, it's the first time we ever performed together, and there's something nebulous about uh, 
to kind of the freedom in jazz to take a song and, and harmonically set it up differently. Um, you have to kind of know the structure. It's very different from classical work in which everything is on the page. The composer has told you exactly what to do on every beat. So that's, that freedom is also risk and uncertainty. Um, so there's excitement to that, the risk part. And you're improvising the whole time, which Charles Lim does so much research about that. It's incredible to me. I want to know what's going on in my brain. <laughs> But, you know, did you ever play the things you played before in the solo in the middle of that? They say there's no such thing as an original idea musically, but, you know, I don't think about it. I just go into that space when I play, and whatever comes out is coming through me and has nothing to, to do with me. For me, all music comes from the creator and through us. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> I call that, for me, that's being in the zone and allowing flow and allowing... I actually lost my stage fright when I realized that I was a conduit yeah. for what oh. other people had created. That really took the pressure off the sense. I always thought the audience was judging me and the energy was coming towards me and it wasn't positive. When I turned it around as something to be shared, suddenly performing was wonderful. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, when we listen to the two of you make music together with Xavier as well, it, in this masterful way, it really speaks to the fact that music has been with us in our history for so long. It taps into something so old and ancient, you know, in the bottoms of our souls or in our brains or wherever that lives. And I wonder, Regina, if you could talk a little bit about the journey that you have gone on to tap into that improvisational nature, uh, because it wasn't always the way. Uh, I mean, you started out having more of a classical right. training. Yes, but I started off as a Suzuki baby, where you learn by ear and you learn by imitating the same way we learn to talk. And it's actually the most natural way when you look at other cultures outside of the Western culture. Most of them, as babies, they learn to dance and to sing from the adults, and they're always in the music circles. And so. When I was introduced to jazz, it was, um, I used to stand in the mirror actually and listen to Motown. And I stand in the mirror and play, because they had great strain parts, the Motown tunes. And I would play along with those parts. And so learning jazz, it was the same thing, just really listening and not only to what they were playing, but how they were playing it. And it's so easy as a young person to get caught up in trying to wow the audience and play all this stuff. And it's really the older I've gotten, I realized it's just try to get out of my own way and let the emotions come through. Because people, it, we're, we're, we're healers. We're healers for the audience. The audience is, they're he healers for us as well. So it's a shared experience. Renee, you've been up. <laughs> you've been a part of the sound help initiative since its inception, as we heard. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about this healing nature and the, you know, does it put a burden on musicians in a way, you know, that maybe not all musicians are willing to take on? Um, well, I think if you're, if you're afraid it's a burden, then performing is terrifying. And I went through lots of periods of experiencing that too. Um, one of the things I think about is the vagus nerve. So can you explain what that is and how that's, that's a healing? I, I actually can tell when I'm practicing, when I've had sessions for two hours um, on learning music, I come away and my mood is lifted, I feel energized, and it's a really a wonderful thing. And it was Deepak Chopra, I met, when I met him, he said, you're so lucky you're a singer because you're stimulating the vagus nerve. Okay, <laughs> so it's the 10th cranial nerve, let's not get specific, but um, essentially, it's involved in balancing the activity of these two autonomic nervous systems that control your internal organs, the sympathetic or fight or flight, and the autonomic rest and digest. And the idea is that a lot of these um, ways in which music can help calm us down are through the action of this nerve uh, that, that is really about rebalancing and, and, and bringing us in, yes, into this more restful, calm state and deep breathing is one of the ways in which we can really get this going. And in fact, in uh, people who continue to suffer from long COVID, 
the, it seems like there might be uh, this, this dysfunction in, in vagal nerve activity. So some of the um, things that you've been doing, singing, helping. Singing, <laughs> yes, so everybody. <laughs> um, so we could talk forever about all the ways in which music specifically can be used as a tool to heal. Um, but I just want to really thank you for sharing with us tonight. I know I speak for everybody here. We were delighted to watch. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you. you. Thank 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 you. I'm Eric Whitaker. I'm a composer and a conductor. I'll be joined in just a moment here on stage by the Children's Chorus of Washington. It is an honor to be here with all of you tonight and to see all of your smiling faces in person. Hey, there they are. Um, As a composer, my job is a strange one in that I spend most of my time alone in my studio. Uh, if I'm very honest, it's usually in my underwear and pulling my hair out and wishing that I would have a real job like an architect or an accountant. But I finish the piece, it gets published, goes out into the world, and as a composer, I rarely have any idea what effect it's having on, on the performers or the audience. I get royalty statements back, that kind of thing, so I can tell if something is being performed often which is not bad, but, uh, but I, I never have a, a connection with the people themselves. That is until really social media came around 12, 13 years ago. And way back in 2009, a friend of mine sent me a link to a YouTube video and said, you have got to see this. And I clicked on it and it was this. Hi, Mr. Eric Whitaker. Um, my name is Britlin Lucy and this is a video that I'd like to make for you. Here's me singing sleep. I'm a little nervous, just to let you know. If I thought Britlin's video was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen before. She didn't know me, and she just sent this video out like an electronic message in a bottle to find me. And find me it did. I remember watching it, and this is of course in, in the era before selfies as well, so it wasn't so typical to look directly in the camera and have such a, such a close-up view of somebody. It was so visceral and immediate. And my very simple idea was, if I could somehow get, Brit, uh, get 25 people to do what Britlin was doing, if they just sang their parts, soprano, alto, tenor, or bass, they could be singing anywhere in the world, in their living rooms, in their garages, in their dorm rooms, as long as they sang at the same tempo and in the same key, and then uploaded their videos. My big idea was just that I would open them in different browser windows and then click play as fast as I could on all of them. <laughs> and this choir would appear, this virtual choir, and so I posted on my blog and Facebook at the time. I said, I've got this idea, who's in? And lo and behold, singers started sending in their videos. All told, for that first choir, we had 185 singers join. And suddenly I had all these video assets, and only then did I realize I know nothing about video editing, I'm a composer. And I also blogged about that, and this young man named Scott Haynes, who was only 22 at the time, emerged from the crowd and said, this is the project I've been looking for my whole life. I wrote back to Scott and said, I've been looking for you my whole life. And Scott stitched all of it together, uh, cleaned up the audio, which, which took months, as you can imagine. Uh, it, um, you know, that you could hear the ambulances in the background or air conditioning. Uh, yeah, on one of the videos, you could hear a young man's mother yelling at him. You know, <laughs> what are you doing in there with the singing? Anyway, we, we made this video and we uploaded it to YouTube. Here's a little excerpt from it. So this is from the year 2010, if you can imagine, 12 years ago, Virtual Choir 1.0. You can see my, my little 
Uh, thank you. Thank you. You can see my little conductor video there, uh, you know, sitting outside all these virtual singers. That's because I made that first. I conducted in complete silence, and then the singers sang only to my conducting. I, I can tell you that day in the studio while I was making that video, the people thought it, were, it was crazy. Um, I uploaded it thinking that really only uh, my fellow choir geeks would find this interesting <laughs> at all. And uh, uh, I, I couldn't have imagined that it would go viral the way that it did. Within the first week, we had a couple million views, and the international news media picked it up. And suddenly, I was bombarded by emails and posts from around the world, singers saying, I don't know what this is, but I have to be a part of it. When is the next one? <laughs> I'd never thought that there would be a next one, but a year and a half later, we uploaded Virtual Choir 2.0, this time another piece that I'd written called Sleep. This time, 2,052 singers from 58 different countries. And the countries that were listed were, were mind-blowing. There were singers from Pakistan and India. There were singers from Egypt and Jordan and Syria and Israel. There were singers from seven countries on the African continent, as far south as New Zealand and as far north as the great Alaskan bush. And so overnight, our little virtual choir experiment had become kind of an earth choir and still more singers were saying, this is amazing, I've just discovered this, when is the next one? And so two years later, uh, pushing the technology as far as we could, we released Virtual Choir 3.0 to a piece I'd written called Water Night. Three thousand seven hundred and fifty six singers from seventy three countries we thank you we during the entire time that we've been working on this project we've had a place where singers could go and post their testimonials what it was like for them to join the choir what it meant to them and we've heard such beautiful stories there was a young man who uh, had gone legally blind uh, and had been unable to sing in a choir since he was a child and for the first time could get close enough to the computer screen and see my little conductor video, he could join the virtual choir. There was uh, a woman, a young woman, who uh, had sung with her mother since she was a child and her mother was dying of cancer in hospice and so as tribute to her, she recorded her video holding her mother's hand just off screen. There was a man from Cuba who desperately wanted to be part of the virtual choir, but because of government regulations, couldn't send a file larger than one meg. So we got our tech team together with him, had him cut it into 26 one meg files, sent them all to us, stitched it back together. Cuba became part of the virtual choir. In 2018, we made our largest virtual choir yet, and this time it was a piece that I'd written called Deep Field, a tribute to the Hubble Telescope, and we partnered with NASA and the Space Telescope Science Institute, and it was premiered at the Kennedy Space Center. And really sitting there amongst astronauts at that hallowed place, I thought, this is the end of the virtual choir experiment. I think we've, <laughs> we've reached literally the end of the known universe. I think that's, that's as far as we can go with this. And then, of course, uh, March of 2020 happened. And around the world, singers stopped singing all at the same time. And many of you may recall that, that there were these news stories about choirs that had continued rehearsing with, within just weeks of the, the, the beginning of the pandemic, and that it, was, it turned out to be fatal. And the idea that our benign and benevolent art form could somehow be a threat I think I can, I can safely speak for singers around the world. We were in shock and we didn't know what to do. It's such a connecting, unifying experience to sing with a group of people. Dr. Murthy talked so much about the importance of community and not being alone. The number one 
feedback that we get from singers who have joined the virtual choir is that they feel part of something larger than themselves. And I got together with the team, which at that time has about a dozen people in, in March of 2020 and said, if there was ever a time for us to make a virtual choir, it's now. So we made the virtual choir. Um, we pushed again the technology as far as we possibly could. At some point we were literally running out of pixels on a 4K screen with the number of singers we have. But we are honored to share with you tonight that video joined here live on stage by the, the wonderful Children's Chorus of Washington. So uh, please welcome the Children's Chorus of Washington. and 17,572 singers from 129 countries.
Hello, hello. Oh, yes! Hey! All right! Hi, people! Yes! <laughs> Beautiful, Michaela. Thank, thank you. you so much for such gift. Thank you so much. While you take a breather, well, thank you. Thank <laughs> I'm you. going I to. It. <laughs> yes, I'm going to introduce myself. Good evening, everybody. Are you enjoying the show? Yes. My name is Mara Rivera. I'm a dance movement psychotherapist. 
I'm a licensed creative art therapist and a somatic wellness practitioner based in New York, in the Bronx. Okay. Yes, so yep, I am here to lead a brief conversation, a brief exploration with Michaela about her process, your process in creating and performing this piece, right? But before I start, have anybody heard of dance movement therapy? Yeah? So let me just briefly give you um, an overview, at least my perspective of it. So dance movement therapy, alongside with the other creative art therapists like music therapy and art therapy, drama therapy, poetry therapy. Um, basically, what I love about dance movement therapy is that I get to work with the body as the meeting point um, between all aspects of the self, mm. right? So we get to work with the physical, we get to work with the emotional, get to work with the social, cognitive, historical, ancestral, and even spiritual, right? So it integrates all of it. Mm -hmm. So when we attend to the body and allow it to express, it's a great ally and a great generator of intelligence, wisdom, and medicine. Our ancestors knew this all along, right? So I would like to ask you some questions. Yes. yes. So um, this piece is titled, when the inner voice comes out. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about the story behind this piece, sure. or perhaps what parts of your story are embodied in this sure, piece? Sure. So this piece is an excerpt from a larger piece that I created for the Joyce Theater this year. And that piece really was a journey about spiritual cycles of life, death, and rebirth. And it was a, it was a abstract um, telling of some experiences I've had in my own life and some of the tools I've used to heal from those experiences. So as you just said, spiritual practices through um, many different forms have influenced that healing process for me. So in this particular show, I took elements of um, self-doubt, uh, trauma, which was this this particular piece, and um, a few other elements, and I used trauma and I associated it with the element of fire, because um, you know there are many stages of healing through particular traumatic events in life, and one of those stages can often be anger and rage, and um, it's only healthy to find a outlet to put those feelings because they do not disappear no matter how much you try. Um, you have to channel that energy into something similar to the way a, a martial artist or a boxer takes that uh, energy and becomes so graceful with their techniques of fighting. So um, I use the element of fire to um, heal this element of anger and rage of, of uh, surviving through a traumatic event. Yes, thank you for sharing that. Um, and I, I'm wonder, <laughs> it's amazing. And I'm wondering, Michaela, um, so tap, I mean, when you think about tap, it's just a fascinating art form, right? And it has right. very, I mean, it's rich history yes. in this country. Yes, absolutely. So I'm wondering how do you use tab to support and validate in, in the telling of your story? Yes, well, you know, tap is a very unique art form, like you said, that comes uniquely born in this country through the um, almost protest of survival of enslaved people um, rerouting the rhythms of the drums through the body, through the feet, through the hands, and so forth. So this really is um, right there, sets the tone that, that tap dance can be a form of joy and that joy can be a form of protest in itself. Um, so with that being said, tap dance is already there. It's already, it's already living in that space. And um, you know, throughout history and time, tap has been funneled through uh, Hollywood and and Broadway, and it's, it's, 
it's taken many shapes and many forms, but the root and the essence of tap dance is still there, that there's just this very rich, deep storytelling and history of protest and joy. Mm, thank you. Yes. The audience is alive and active, yes. So, um, so you know, this piece, I think that when I spoke to you, this piece is, you am just improvised. Yes, right? that was all improvised. All improvised, right? Yes. And so, yeah. And, and just to let everybody know, the words were written by myself, but the voice you heard was, was Anna DeVere Smith. So just, you know, she's a, a legend. So a round of applause for Anna. Yes. Who also, this is why I said it, my mind is uh, moving quick here. She improvised how she interpreted my writing. I did not give her any direction. I emailed her some words. And she, without any knowledge of why I wrote it or my experience, she immediately tuned right into the feeling without even having to give her any type of direction or even concept of what I was thinking about. And the piece took a, a mind of its own. And that's the power of improvisation. Yes. Yeah, and the power of improvisation, definitely, it's something that I, I feel that when you improvise, it's kind of like a doorway, right, to the unknown, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. So I'm wondering, what is your anchor in terms of where, where do you improvise from? Is there a place? Is there, right, yeah. that, an idea, an energy? Um, well, that really comes from love, you know, my love of the art form and what it represents and who passed it on to me and who I learned from. Um, so my anchor and my root is really returning back to my love and my passion for why this particular art form and then its extensions, you know, jazz music and, and, and you know, the, the uh, family members of tap dance, you know, the brothers and sisters of tap dance have, um, just opened up love in my heart, and, and that always, keep, always keeps me grounded and rooted in why I'm doing what I'm doing. Yes. So, um, so that's it. But before we go, um, thank you, Michaela. Thank, thank you, you um, everybody, for your audience, um, for your you. um, aliveness and love. And thank you to Matisse, who played so and Matisse on the piano, Matisse, Matisse Picard. Thank you, everybody. Good evening. I'm Charles Lim. I'm the co-director of the Sound Health Network together with Dr. Julian Johnson. When we formed the Sound Health Network about three years ago, we articulated a mission statement. And the goal of the mission statement was to focus on promoting the science of music and its impact on health and well-being. When the pandemic hit, it really put this mission statement to the test. As a surgeon in a busy academic medical center, I have to say that I was confronted by watching the world change in a way that was terrifying and also very humbling. In the chaos that ensued, millions of lives were lost, millions of lives irreparably damaged. And where was music during all of this? At first, it seemed like music was nowhere. Concerts were canceled. There were no gatherings. All public performances stopped. The Kennedy Center was quiet. And yet, we noticed that if we looked around, somehow music was everywhere. We turned to music for comfort. We played musical instruments. We composed songs. We used the internet as a way to escape the confines of our quarantines. We attended virtual concerts. We took online classes. We witnessed the efforts of musicians globally to raise efforts and funds to make the world a better place in this time of need. Italians sung from their balconies. Music rocked. In this time of pain, music was a balm. It soothed our hearts. It fueled our minds. It was also a glue. It reminded us that perhaps more than anything else, music can bring together people in a way that very few things can. Now, when we think about the nature of pain and suffering, it takes us immediately to resilience. 
And through resilience, through a combination of our efforts, the performances returned. Through our sciences, the concert halls opened up again. Look around. You're all here tonight as a show to the testament of the power of music. Pandemic be damned, the music never stopped. And I'm reminded of something that I always knew as a scientist, but sort of see now in a new light. Wherever and whenever there have been humans, there has always been music. There will always be music. So with this backdrop in mind, I'd just like to thank you from the bottom of my heart at the Sound Health Network for being here tonight to support music and for being living proof of how important it is for music to impact our health and our well-being. And with that, I'd like you to join me in welcoming the moving voices and musical resilience of Afro Blue. Good evening, everyone. We are Afro Blue, Howard University's premier vocal jazz ensemble. Thank you all so much. We're so elated to be with you all here on tonight just to celebrate this huge event on helping us all heal through these trying times and the power that music plays on this healing that we have. So we're going to leave you with a little bit of encouragement with this first tune. You all may find it a little familiar. This is Stan Vincent's Ooh Child. Get 
Dr. Marisol Norris. I'm the Director of Music Therapy and Counseling at Drexel University and the founder of the Black Music Therapy Network. Yeah. Over the past three years, Esperanza Spalding and creative collaboration with a community of cultural workers, musicians, music therapists, researchers, and scientists assembled for the Songwrights Apothecary Lab. At the center of this work was a profound love, a love for people, their full beings, the musical transformations and freedom, a love for the breath of musicking and all the possibilities it holds, and a love for the work of deepening the healing potential of music that can only be done through communion. Author educator Faima Ife in her book, Maroon Choreography, centers black maroon traditions and the single disciplinary trajectories typically upheld to understand the magnitude of the human experience, the privileges it often affords, and the limits of labor within walls. Oh, but then Ife speaks about radical creative amalgamations, the communion of people, the interdisciplines, cross-disciplines, the intentionally undisciplined, and the movement away from the proverbial fields to radically imagine something new. Tonight, Esperanza Spaulding, Dr. Helena Hansen, and the members of the Songwrights Apothecary Lab taking stage <laughs> want to center communal placemaking of black improvisatory traditions and consider the transformation, resistance, freedom and communion that stems from this healing legacy. Communal knowing is so very vital to the work that we do. So tonight, rather than solely speaking about it or even performing about it, tonight we're gonna be about it. Yes, be about it. <laughs> Following the words of Faima Ife and the spirit of the Songwrights Apothecary Lab, we invite you to rem remember the black and indigenous communities and healing traditions central to this work. Radically reimagine our human experience through this musical offering and ask more of what we make of communing, of coming, of dispersing, of moving, of learning alongside one another, arrive, and arrive again in communion. I keep, I keep going like this, and it feels like the appropriate gesture because this is the part of the evening where the performance is over. We're not performing anymore. We're not. What we're gonna be doing is musicking together. Yes. Yes, and I wanna let you know it's okay to not know what we're gonna do. You are all now part of the band, 
And I want you to know you're in the same seat as these phenomenal, phenomenal people you see on stage because they don't know what we're going to do either. <laughs> and that's okay. So this is a practice that I invite you all to join in. I like to call it communal musicking or co-composing. So just to walk you kind of through how it's going to go, knowing that we don't know exactly how it's going to go. We'll start by taking a few breaths together. And when we take those breaths together, I invite you to just touch into how you're feeling, how you're actually feeling. This is not a performance anymore. So we can, we can, you can shake that out of expecting it, and we can shake it out of trying to do it. We're not performing. We're, we're musicking now. Touch into how you're feeling, really feeling, knowing that you know, we all know deep in our system what we need from music to help us feel better. So from that place, we'll hear a few things that you come up with when you're touching into your feeling. And we're all, all of us, going to use that as our musical prompt. And all of us as co-composers, we're going to draw from our innate musicianship to co-compose that sound. And I know that sounds kind of crazy. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> and then we'll see where we go. And we'll trust ourselves as listeners and as musicians, as music makers. And I want to give you a, a secret and a cue. It's actually an advantage to not be a musician. Because sometimes us musicians have a hard time letting go of all the things we think we're supposed to do and just being present for what's actually happening and just allowing what we hear and feel to guide where the music goes. So know that if you don't identify as a musician, you're actually in the privileged seat for this exercise, okay? So, let's just shake out the performance thing. We just, yeah, just relax, just let it go. We just here in a room together. And if, if you feel inclined to, we'll just take three good breaths together. One, and let it out. Another big breath in. Let it out nice and slow. Another big breath in. Let it out nice and slow. And just take a minute to feel what you feel, what you wish for from music today, right now in this moment together. And we're gonna, I'm gonna invite somebody on the stage to just call out what you wish for in music tonight. It could be simple, it could be complex, anything. Anybody? Any old thing. Be present. Be present. So that's part of our prompt in the music we're gonna make, be present. Anything else? Harmony, of, of course, I mean, you know, of course. <laughs> But yeah, okay, so that's another one of our prompts. Anything else? Anything else? Joy. Joy. Oh, I, like, I heard joy and love. So be present. Harmony, joy, and healing. Now, I know the song doesn't exist yet, but I'm sure we have a sense of what that feels and sounds like. So from that sense of what that feels and sounds like, be present. Harmony joy, love. Now know each of us is a musician that's going to give forth listening and sound towards the co-creation of that music. You ready? Okay. So let's take one more big breath in. Let it out. And the sound that comes, comes.
I know we have time to tend to, but I just wanted to give us a second to just be here with each other. Be present and feel for a minute before we move on. So it was really special. Ask more of what we make of communing, of coming, of dispersing, of moving, of learning, learning alongside, alongside one, another. one another. Arrive. And arrive again in, in communion. communion. Esperanza Spalding. Thank you, Esperanza. So good. Thank you for participating, too, and for being with us tonight. And we hope you'll come again. Did you enjoy this? Yeah. Let's get everybody out on stage who didn't join in this. If there are people lurking there uh, off stage, come on, everybody. Everyone out. What an evening this has been. Lifting our spirits, lifting our hearts. Caesar. Hey, come on, Caesar. Come on, Robert. And if you enjoyed the curiosity that you just experienced. There's a whole lot more of that coming uh, tomorrow, starting 10 o'clock. All kinds of things over in the reach, activations, discussions, workshops, and much more. So please plan to show up tomorrow. It's going to be an experience as this was tonight. Yes, please join us. Okay, thank you, Francis. Good night, everybody.